I had a lot of issues at my home. So I moved out. I said goodbye and I moved out of my house all alone. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on this. Right. Um, I started off uh, when I was 17 years old as a, as a teacher. Right. That was my first job. And it was, uh, it was through necessity that I had to become a teacher simply because um, by 16 I had finished uh, uh, becoming an accomplished pianist. So I was, I was uh, a trained pianist from, from like five years old. Right, so by 16, I would, uh, was able to teach elocution, uh, speech and drama, and piano. Okay. Right. So my family was going through a really hard time at the time. So uh, the first thing that we had to do was um, figure out a way to maybe ease some of the burden, because I wanted to do uh, London A levels. Okay. Yeah. So I started classes at home, mm -hmm. and uh, because I registered myself. Of yeah. course, it was a legitimate business as always. Yeah. Right, uh, and I, I started sending children for Trinity College of London examinations. It was all good. Uh, one class became two, became three, and uh, by the time I was 18, I had classes all five days of the week, and this had become a business for me. So what started out as a as a venture to probably manage my tuition fees became something that I was really paying my way through education with. Right, so it was through necessity that I became that. Uh, I got through my study. At 20, I got into law college, and I had to make a, de make a decision: how am I going to continue my teaching career? Because by that time, teaching had become a big business for me, and I had moved on from uh, English classes at home, right, to mass classes for IELTS. And by 20, I had five locations, five buildings that I had uh, set up classes in: Vellavatta, Malvana, uh, Kalania, right. And I had really cut my teeth in, into the uh, mass market education business, right? And law college became quite a thing to handle because yeah. it was full-time lectures and I had to give up. Because by 20, I was earning quite a, quite a good amount, right? But I managed it. I started going to college and I went, finished my studies at law college. And throughout that time, I expanded my teaching career as well. By 22, I started... Uh, uh, giving, becoming a resource person for Columbia University, right? And then by 23, I was a consultant for Slim, and I wrote a book called Business English and Personality Development that became the uh, study text for Slim, yes. which I think still is the study official study text at Slim, right? And I ended up writing another book on postgraduate project management for Slim also. This all by 23, and I had to make a huge decision. It came to a point where I had to decide whether I'm going to be an attorney at law or whether I'm going to continue teaching. By that time, uh, there was a job offer out there for a copywriter at, a, at an advertising agency called Ruby Studio. Right. Okay. So I was into English and writing and they were looking for a particular type of writer that would help them with a, a curriculum for a children's television show Right. that was on Sira, sir. Uh, that, that really gave structured English language lessons on TV. Right. And I found that these guys had uh, help from Sesame Street who were helping them do their show. And so it was like uber cool to get involved with this. And I did. So I took the job, right? And I said goodbye to becoming an attorney at law. I, I had to make that choice and I made it. And the good thing is I made it overnight. Uh, this show, right, became a super popular show. It was called English Class for Me. It was on Sira Sir, right at 5.30, I think in the morning and hundreds of thousands of kids watched it. So that was from, from English teacher at home to IELTS mass market to national television. Right? I had made three steps and I was working. You know, everything was working out for me. Yeah. This and that and TV shows and what not. And I said, I don't need anybody, right? I can do this alone. And suddenly, I went through depression for about six months. I, I couldn't write. The writing stopped. I couldn't write a single word. I had written over 40 episodes for TV at that time. And I couldn't write a single word. It was a challenging time for me. I went through a personal crisis. I had a lot of issues at my home. So I moved out. I said goodbye. And I moved out of my house all alone. We had shot so many episodes of being in front of the camera so many times. Nothing worked. Why? Because I was feeling down. I was really gone. Right. And that was the break for me in writing and English teaching altogether. And I actually had a break of about three months completely in Korea and I had to reset myself. So there was an opportunity to join a leading company, right? Okay. And they were looking for a learning and development manager. 
it's someone different who could come and and set up uh, internal curriculums for the company. And uh, this was my job because I had done it for Slim, I had done it for National TV, and I had the chops for it. So I went for it. Again, things started working. It was a fantastic time for me. I learned so much, right? And I I learned how the corporate sector learned. So all this time, I knew how kids learned, right? And then I went to adolescent, I went to teenagers, I went to people in their twenties who were my age. Then suddenly I started seeing how do these big managers, these senior managers and CEOs, how do they do learning? And I learned it. I was there ground level doing it. I was a trainer, right? And then by the time I left, I decided I was slowly thinking, no, I have unfinished business in children's television, right? I need to go back and finish what I started because I was really passionate about about teaching kids in Sri Lanka. And I thought, no, I'm going to do something different. Now I have a master corporate. Exposure. I'm going to set up my first company. Right, I was working on it one day at a time. By the time I hit 27, I decided to quit dialogue. Okay, I quit my job, and I went and started my first limited company, Techniques Intermedia, which is Sri Lanka's first company for children's television. Sri Lanka's first company specializing in children's television. I had to buy my own airtime from ITA. So I bought a year's worth of airtime with the help of my investor and business partner. Right. I mean, I could not have done it without him. And and and, and uh, I remember once we had bought the airtime, we knew we could craft the show into what what we wanted it to be. So we got fantastic sponsors on board, and we ran a show for a year on ITA. You know, we had a million viewers a month. Okay. In 2012, on ITN, watching this show, children from all parts of Sri Lanka used to write to us say, "What's next week? Send us their drawings." And yeah. it was manic, yeah. right? Twice a week. Now, when we started the business, I had really good. I had I had a lot of luck, especially in finding the right business partner. So I'm very thankful to this day to my business partner. His name is Shri. I had a good friend of mine who came in at the right time to save that idea and, and invest some money so that we could get it going. But the thing is, I got carried away with the passion project, okay? And I was completely blinded to the economics of this, right? And by the time we hit the first year, the sponsors were already creaking because Sri Lanka is not a place for children's television. Right? Mm. Sponsors aren't inclined to put money behind that. They always want to go for teledramas and. And you know Sports that kind of main, mainstream stuff, right? It's a bit sad. It's a bit sad to be honest. But I was blinded by the passion project, so I was thinking, no, 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 nobody is ever going to drop this show. But when our contract ended, we found it very difficult to find another sponsor, and we kept the company going. I pushed it, kept pushing the business. No, we can, no, we can, because we're doing something good, right? Something will happen. Something didn't happen. Three to four years later, we had to close our business operations. But I also learned in its failure that something so good to be true, too good to be true, can fail if you are not aware, and if you don't really heed those warnings that are coming your way. So this, this, uh, when when this business was ending, that's when my second company's idea came into my mind. I had now graced production. By that time, I had produced uh, a lot of stuff. I had even uh, gone to produce some major national events as a producer. So by this time, um, I wanted to merge my production experience with training. So I, I, I saw how NASA was training the astronauts, and it was not by sending them for workshops, right? It was by experience. Right? And I and I thought, hey, wait, what is the number one thing people need to learn? They need experiences. And what is the number one thing producers do? They create experiences. That's what we do. We spend millions of dollars and shoot a 30-minute video so that you could sit there and pay money to watch it. Right? You've seen the list of credits at the end of a movie. So many moving parts. So I thought, yeah, I know this is my business. This is home turf for me. I'm going to take that and I'm going to completely revolutionize the way people train. So I started Sandbox. Right. At first, I saw a market need for people to change the way that they learned because workshops were getting so boring. Now I had been in the position of managing learning and development in the corporate sector, and I saw how boring things can get. And I saw how ineffective things were when they became boring, and I also saw a huge gap in the ability for these learning learning programs to provide actual learning experiences. So that was a gap that I saw. But whether it was a gap in the market, the honest answer is no. The honest truth is no. It was not a gap in the market. 
people were dying to say oh no we want to ditch workshops give us something better and and i always uh, compared myself to steve jobs launching the uh, the iphone right or the ipod right that you know or, or henry ford who said you know if if you ask people what they wanted they would have said they wanted a faster buggy yeah. if you ask people what they wanted they would have said they want a better c a better a cd player right yeah. a discman remember yeah. the discman yeah right give me a better discman that yeah. plays 200 songs on a cd yeah. that's what they would have asked they would not in their wildest dreams have imagined this touch device that fits into this obscure pocket in your jeans right that's what he said this this pocket in my jeans it was made for the ipod right and that takes vision and that is not necessarily filling a dying need in a market you are creating one and i wanted to balance and in sandbox the first business was customized experiences so we launched our first brand colombo paintball league you would have heard of the brand right it's it was sri lanka's first brand a first unit that gave you militarized experiences yeah. so call of duty right we played the real deal so i knew a lot of the people in the military right and i had made friends with a guy who was sri lanka's first graduate from west point okay. right so i got him on board to be our trainer his name is mendaka mm-hmm. right mr mendaka hetti that's a great guy and he came on board and i we formed colombo paintball league to give you all anybody a legit military experience so this was not some some guy who played call of duty at home yeah. in his shorts and yeah. bunny slippers this is a real west point grad yeah. training you how to make those moves how to clear a room how to flank right and the operation map was completely done production grade and in 2015 we launched it and that was a start of something completely crazy we went into f1 experiences right we completely boiled down the whole f1 experience and now you can race you have your own racing car dilanta malagamo is your trainer right he teaches you how to drive yeah. uh you you have pit stops you have tire changeovers you have endurance racing all in a day and the third experience we uh, gave people was culinary experiences where you can take over nanas in golf race Okay. Yeah, and you don't believe. It. You should look at the photographs. The top directors of top companies in Sri Lanka have gone and taken over nanas and cooked. Yeah. With sandbox. Yeah. You've done it. Yeah. Now we are a consulting company and uh, we are in 11 industries in Sri Lanka. We deal with the top Fortune 500 brands, top MNC, right? And we deliver team performance. We deliver performance consulting overall. and we've taken that experience business that we started 5 years ago and grown it now to business that delivers million dollar performances to companies so it's it's been a huge journey right a roller coaster of new stuff but what i what i probably uh, want to summarize on that is that the drive has always been to do something new never to copy never to take some method does something that somebody has done in another country and replicated no everything has been innovated here in sri lanka every idea is new it has never been done before and we were the first to do it we were the first to get out there when i when i started yes it was out of necessity and i think the best innovations come out of necessity right when you when you push to the wall uh over time my inspiration has changed from necessity to purpose right so necessity yes i started i started teaching at home i i paid my way through some of my classes got somewhere in life and 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 now it's about purpose right now it's about not and, and still it hasn't come to make him money right money i always believe is a by product of good business right money is a by product and if you're doing it well you will but you need to obviously look at your economics right when you do it but it's a by product so i'm never driven by the money we can make mm-hmm. i'm always driven by whether i'm creating some sort of uh, uh, solving a problem you know solving a problem and sometimes problems you can't wait for people to tell you what the problem is when you're a leader yeah right when you're leading that's the job of the leader to see that there is a problem that's going to come up in 6 months and work towards solving people are going to say we don't need this right now yeah look at us holding these touch screen phones yeah. we don't need this do we we do we wake up we can live without it but it took a leader to envision that and put this in our hand right yeah. otherwise you would have said we hold it that brick yeah. 
right? We would have been fine with it. We would have been playing CDs off our waist off a disc one and we would have been fine with it, right? We would have been driving cars with leaded petrol and we would have been fine with it, right? Yeah. But we are not and that's because somebody saw it and that's what drives me now. Purpose and creating and leading that purpose is a completely different ball game to being a typical business that answers that purpose. So I'm in the business of creating purpose. Okay. I've, I've done so many mistakes so I can give a lot of advice. So first advice is be careful about who you take advice from. Not everybody can give you advice. You have to select very carefully who you want to be associated with. It's, it's not about being vain. It's not about feeling invincible or something. I'm, I'm just saying be careful because sometimes people give you good advice and it's all, it's all coming from here. But they just don't have the experience to empathize with where you want to go, to see your vision, to give you the right advice. It's good advice, but it might not be the right advice. So first step as an entrepreneur, if you're getting out there, surround yourself with people who have an experience very similar to where you want to go. So that when the advice is given, you know you can trust that advice that this man or woman has been somewhere similar to where I want to go. Big mistake a lot of people make by listening to everybody. Because everybody can't see your vision, only you can. Second piece of advice, back up, back up, back up, back up. Okay, there is no end to contingency planning. You have to think of every possible angle and plan for it before you set out there. Because remember, as an entrepreneur, you're setting out there to be a professional, right? You're not setting out there to be an amateur. So it is your duty and your responsibility if you're charging somebody one rupee for something to think of every possible angle to cover it. Third and final piece of advice, validate your passion projects. Validate your passion projects. You start something as a passion project, but validation of that passion project might be bad news for you. Somebody might tell you, look, don't go down this road, or at least don't go down this road yet. Listen to that advice. If somebody is telling you, I got a lot of advice for that and I didn't listen. And I paid a lot, you know, personally I paid with my personal life because it affects you. It affects you when failures happen. When financial failures happen, it's not only rupees and cents that you lose. You lose months and years of your life. Right? I had spent months without a, without, a, without a rupee coming into my bank. right? And that takes so much from you. Right? So my advice is validate your passion projects in terms of, of economics and see, is this something that is going to give you an economic stability? Is it something that's going to pull you through as an entrepreneur? Because if you don't make it, your passion project is not going to make it. Right? So save yourself. Save yourself right? for the right time. Right? Local conglomerates are taking million rupee loans from international finance corporation to keep their businesses afloat. So it's not a good time. Yeah. It's not a great time. So validate your passion projects. My, my constant goal for myself or my business is to constantly be relevant. Whatever future will be in, I want to be relevant as soon as possible. Right. And that means rethinking almost every day. Rethinking everything. Right. Some of the clients I have, I have made beautiful high-end lingerie. Right. The top brands in the world. Right. And now they're making the most ugly thing that you can make. a face mask. Okay. Right? And it takes that. That's what it takes overnight to decide no, if this is what we need to do, right? Then to be relevant, to be of service, we're going to do it. And it's possible. So, same for us as a smaller company. What if, whatever it is that is required from us to be relevant in the provision of a service, that's what we want to do. For Sandbox, mainly the goal is to take Sri Lankan HR innovation global. We are the first company in Sri Lanka to do it. We are the first. Yeah. And we've owned this space for quite some time. And we are strong and we are moving forward because we want to. We have, you can see the fight in us, right? Yeah. We want to take our innovations global. And we are happy that our Sri Lankan uh, companies, the CEOs and HR heads of very progressive Sri Lankan companies, we are so thankful that they are fighting with us to do it. And they are getting these products and by doing that, the products are getting global exposure. And that's my goal for Sandbox, to ensure that we will make a global name in consulting and HR innovations from Sri Lanka as opposed to the other way, always buying
consulting and global innovation from outside companies right i want to t- turn this around i i definitely take time actively take time to keep myself in check by innovating so i'm a musician right i'm a trained musician so i always have time for my music i always have time for my arts right i always do so my my film and my music although sometimes i don't do it professionally anymore i still go for it right keep sharp i always keep sharp because i never forget those are the skills that have given me this creativity if i if i didn't get trained in music if i didn't get trained in art i would not have this eye for detail and that is the eye that i use for my business right so if i constantly do keep doing a business routine yeah that's not going to make me any sharper right so i keep i keep my focus on that and my routine is yes i am i'm i'm planned in my week my weekends are for me and my family it's to do the things that matter the most right and i have time for business i am not a, i i was earlier a guy who would work at 12 o'clock in the night and 1 o'clock in the morning but that has stopped there's a time for everything right and then sooner you tell your customers and tell the people around you the better yeah. there's a time for everything and that that gives a lot of structure to your life yeah. my inspiration was to merge production with training mm-hmm. and i knew uh, we had to create an experience where people could fail okay right there is just just isn't enough experiences out there that you can fail at because that's where you learn you don't learn when you're doing things well you really don't because it doesn't register as hard as it would if you fail at it right that's how we learn to walk we just start walking from day one we crawl we fell and we learned how to adjust ourselves and now we're walking and once we learn walk we don't fall we rarely do because we don't look back but that's the process of human learning so i i created sandbox and that's what sandbox means it's a safe place for you to make mistakes right you can come into sandbox and make mistakes and then take the data from those mistakes and correct so sandbox now delivers data driven performance right? we're into people analytics we're into high performance experiences and we're into performance consulting and all of these things tied together so you do an experience with us example you do your experience for teams where you want to boost your performance by million dollars we get you there we get you there putting your teams and making them feel what an f1 team is like so that they know what it takes to run a team like that and fail doing it without failing in your actual operation and then we have data that binds together that validation that is needed for them to change their mind and we change it so that's what sandbox is all about the core market for sandbox has been corporates we don't differentiate between big and small big uh, and small corporates however Uh, the solutions of st- such stature that you also need to have a certain amount of financials to be able to afford the work that goes into giving you that performance and because of that our clientele has become the top companies in the country right so if you look at go to our website and you look at the work that we have done you see the fortune 500 brands i'm talking about you see the mnc is i'm talking about right and these are repeat clients for us because they believe in this but they also have the structure and the global mindset to and, and the vision to hire our products yeah and and i and i hope my wish is that all sri lankan companies and and regional companies to start with now we have some regional clients who have the forward thinking mindset to get these products to get these analytics services to get the assessments that we do to get the technology to back their decision making and i hope that will happen sooner than later but i but i'm very happy i'm very thankful to the clients we have because they've taken a massive leap of faith in trusting a small company in sri lanka to deliver these big solutions and i and we've done we've done well we've done well to deliver you know your story is actually very very interesting